Welcome to the future. PBS Digital. Previously on Everyday Edison's product patents were applied for. The design team gave the Scrapbook Ladies Magnetic Blue Binder a new look. I mean, I think it just makes them a much better impression, so I'm really jazzed. Wendy chose Buffudium over Babylon to be the name of her idiom game. And, it, and she made the right decision. I think it's the best one for the game. I love the, the name. I really do. And after passing its first field test, the engineering team made minor modifications to the Murtaugh masonry hoe to improve its performance. There's still a lot of issues to resolve, but the fundamental premise of the concept, this, is, is absolutely brilliant. Every great idea deserves a chance. A chance to change the way we live, the way we work, and the way we play. From thousands of ideas pitched at casting calls across the country, seven were handpicked to be developed by a team of product development experts. Each idea will be designed, engineered, branded, and sent to store shelves. And each product's inventor will play a pivotal role in the evolution of their product. Millions could be made, obstacles overcome, dreams will come true on this season of Everyday Edison's. With the product development process in full gear for all of our products, our team will now be hard at work transforming each of our Everyday Edison's ideas and rough prototypes into real life products that in the end could be the next big thing in the marketplace. Through time, successful inventions that have stood the test of time have often come from ordinary people who've had extraordinary ideas. Brilliance is the ability to look at something and say, I can do it better. Jack Stanley is the curator of the Thomas Edison Museum in Menlo Park, New Jersey. You don't need a degree from MIT to do that. You need intellect, intuition, curiosity, and a vivid imagination. That's inventing. And Stanley says Edison's brilliance wasn't in the ideas he had, but in the way he created demand for them. He was able to take an idea, play with it redesign it and make it something palatable for consumption with mankind. Today we have a lot of want-based products, things that you really you can you could do without them, but people want stuff. Joanne Hayes Rhines is the founder and editor of Inventors Digest. What does it take uh, for the best new product? It takes filling a real need. Look at need first, and from that, some of the most amazing products will come. And experts see no end in sight for the invention of useful new products. There are great discoveries coming. There are Edisons in our future that are just going to floor us with amazing ideas. And the incredible thing about amazing ideas, they're usually the most simple, because we don't see them, and they're right before our faces. That's what I'm waiting for. And sometimes the simplest ideas can become the best products. Franklin Ramsey came to us with this. His handmade prototype, a trash can with pie-shaped cuts in either side that holds trash bags firmly in place. Sounds simple, but can our team turn Frank's trash can idea into a consumer treasure? For somebody like myself who, who happened to have this idea, this is a one, this is a, a big thing for me. It's a big shot for me. And, and, and certainly I want to see it to be as big a success as it can be. Frank's garbage can was an interesting proof of concept prototype. He came to us with an idea. 
he had developed a proof of concept model to show that it actually works. Our goal now is to actually transform that into something that works better. We've got to, from a design standpoint and also from an engineering standpoint, figure out what's the best materials to make this out of. How are we going to produce it in a way that it's cost effective and therefore can be commercialized? And then most importantly, how do we create this look around the technology that people will recognize immediately and it will be evident to them how this product actually performs. So the design team immediately went to work challenged with turning an ordinary trash can into an extraordinary time-saving home or office tool. So our task is to turn this into design, but we also want to call out this technology um, so that honestly people are interested in it. One of the first things that I wanted to look at was how simplified this form could be um, and still have all the technology value. We have this mock-up here and what I've done is just simply taken a Dremel into a standard trash can, the one I had underneath my desk, and just tried to do almost like a cross pattern to see how it functioned. And the good thing is it did. The good thing about this is you can get a more iconic shape from a form that's much more open in its negative space. It's almost like branding the can with a logo or identity. And that's the idea of really calling out this technology. Now that you got the business work taken care of, let's get on to the fun stuff. We know we have to really promote this product when you get out there. It needs to just not magically appear. It needs to be, have character um, and form. And what I'm hoping to do is actually turn that negative space that grabs the bag into that form and character. Before the X marks the spot design goes to branding, it's up to the engineering team to test and make sure the design will work. So it's very much a take this iconic shape and try to maintain it within uh, something that actually works. So Tom took Daniel's drawings and 3D renderings into a computer-aided design or CAD program to determine the dimensions Frank's new trash can technology should have. So what we basically have going on is a set of fingers that hold the bag. Then he poured the molds. And inserted the molds into a trash can just like the one Frank used for his original proof of concept prototype. Then Tom tested the mock-ups. One had a red mold that had a finger-sized circumference in the center of the X, and the one with the blue mold that kept the design integrity of Daniel's iconic shape, but had very little space in the intersection of the X. With that, I guess we should just uh, put some bags in these things and see how they work. Feet coming back out. We if you grab it. throw something in it. <laughs> we need a brick. Where's right? the brick? <laughs> yeah. right. short bag. <laughs> Testing revealed that both mock-ups worked, but a decision had to be made which design direction to go. We decided fairly early on that we needed a coefficient of, of friction that would work well with the different plastic bags. We know most of them are, are either high or low density polyethylene, depending on their cost. And we knew that we had to do certain things with the geometry to prevent it from grabbing the finger. So we, we mocked up a bunch of stuff and we, we thought through it and basically came up with something which would not be that aggressive when you're pulling your finger back out of it. So this design actually works better with your finger, but people perceive it to work maybe, maybe as well, but probably not as well because actually you get some sort of tactile reactionary input from this one so that's what we ended up going with. So after the mock-ups were designed, built, and tested, it was time to show Frank what progress the Everyday Edison product development team had made on his project. Well, that one's a little loose. Yeah, I like that better. I like, I like the tension on that better. It's, it's, just, just, it's just as easy to get the bag in there, but it seems to grip it better. So it was unanimous. Frank picked the better performing insert and was thrilled about the product's progress. And for them to go through all this process of testing the different shapes, the different materials and everything is what I would like to have done, but I just didn't have the ability to. I just, 
I took the idea as far as I could. Retired New York City firefighter Stan Joya learned a lot on the job in his 20 plus years. It's what he learned on his downtime that brought him to us after a near fatal heart attack forced him to retire from the job that he cherished. Stan picked up plumbing, carpentry, and electrician skills from his firehouse friends. Knowledge he put to use when he invented this, a T-square with notches in it that allows you to accurately mark, score, and cut drywall. We had 50 guys assigned to that firehouse. And out of those 50 guys, I would say 40 of them knew another trade, who was an electrician, who was uh, a spackler, who was a, a, a bricklayer, who was, and I learned a little bit from each of them. Every inventor believes that their product will function as promised. But unfortunately, sometimes products don't really live up to those expectations. It's our responsibility to make sure that the product actually performs as promised. What we have to do is we have to seek outside assistance. We have to have consumers test the product. We have to have experts test the product. And we also have to do some internal testing to make sure that this product is actually going to perform as promised and live up to that promise. So Stan's T-square was put to the test. Internally, the Everyday Edison's engineering team gave Stan square high marks. It is easier than the way that we've always done it in the past, using a tape measure and holding the, holding the blade to the end of the tape measure and running it across. And I think it's a lot easier than that. You get a much straighter line. Uh, you're also not as prone to take off your thumb or partially remove your thumb with that method. It's kind of, it is somewhat dangerous. There's a lot of ways to cut yourself in the old fashioned way. So this one was nice in that it removed a lot of those elements of danger. Externally, product testing pros also saw value in Stan's T-square. I think it's a great idea. I have struggled uh, working with drywall, trying to cut it. Uh, as far as accurate cuts, you start to cut and you get a wavy line. Uh, this is very easy to use, it's very intuitive. Uh, you can look at it and you can say, yep, I know how to use it. And then you take your knife and you can put it in the notch and it's very accurate. You get a very straight cut. With positive test results and a viable working prototype in hand, the commercialization team made a decision that would change the course of Stan's project and bring his dream of seeing his invention make it to market one step closer. When you get a product, the first thing you have to decide is what is going to be the exit strategy. How are you going to monetize the investment that you've made in your invention? And so when the T-Square was brought to us, we looked at this product and we said, does it make sense to build a business around taking this product to market and building the infrastructure and the sales channel to sell this into retailers? Or in some situations, does it make sense to license a product to a manufacturer that already has distribution, that already has a sales force, that already has a line of products that complement the product that we have right here. I believe at this point that the best way to bring value to this invention is to seek out a licensee, a partner who will take on this product and in exchange for a royalty will distribute the product, will make this product their brand and get this product into the retail channels and ultimately achieve success. You guys came along and, and, and just pushed me like it's, it's made me feel like once you saw the tool and, 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 and took interest in it, that, that I had a good chance of, of, of going on. If necessity is the mother of invention, then our next Everyday Edison is a grandmother of great ideas. Faced with having her children struggle with traveling with their children, Maria Pistioli stayed up one night and put together this, a diaper bag that opens up and converts into a baby carrier and a bassinet. This bag is, a, to me, to me, it's amazing. If it's, any parent can have it, you need to have it for the little ones. 
Maria comes in the studio with her invention. She obviously has put a great deal of time and effort in creating her product. And she's done a very good job of solving a number of different problems that mothers face all in one tool. What Maria needs help with at this point is with design. To sell a product today, especially a baby bag, it's gotta have a design that parents, especially mothers, are gonna wanna carry. So our first step in this process with Maria is to take it into industrial design and create a look, a feel to the product that consumers are gonna to wanna to purchase. For Maria's project, the Everyday Edison's industrial design and branding teams will work together with Maria to redesign her three-in-one baby bag. What I've got here on the table, and we'll kind of look out on the, on the screen as well, are some of the initial sketches from your, your product. And what the great thing is we have a product and a prototype to look at. So you've started the process, and now we're going to start refining it to make it you know, something that's you know, retail savvy, has the look, the feel, and the functionality, and add the features. The great thing about your product is you have a lot of storage. The only thing is, is when you try to access the, the bassinet, we're having to take out the contents that are in it, and in some cases yeah. that could be quite a lot of diapers, mm -hmm. wipes, um, ointments, things like that. So that's one of the first kind of you know concerns I have is is how can we um, get all the functionality without having to unpack the articles that are inside the bag. You couldn't keep the side panels yeah. up, and that, we don't want those draping in the baby, and we don't yes. want a parent having to worry about them. So I got some sketches that may resolve that. Yeah. Um, and I and, could make the, pen, uh, the canopy. I cannot make the canopy. Yeah, and the canopy too. We yeah. talked about that. As yeah. It would be great if it, in the park scenario because, Matt, one thing I've been kind of imagining with the product is it's, it's perfect for parents who are active and into and almost a little bit into the outdoors because they can take their baby with them. And it's like kind of this park buddy picnicking scenario where you have a lightweight bassinet that kind of pops up and expands. Um, so adding a canopy and mosquito net would be great. So with some innovative ideas on the table after the first round of ideation, Maria felt confident her project was headed in the right direction. I love it. I love the idea of Daniel, the way he turned everything around. And uh, we work together, you know, to fix the product up the way he wants it. So uh, I don't have no objection for that. It's great. It's good. But before the Everyday Edison's team moved on to the final design, branding, and engineering stages, team leaders decided to bring in an expert in the world of baby products to be a consultant on Maria's project. Meet Michelle Bulo, a working mom who single-handedly turned handmade baby gifts into the Bellatuno line of upscale baby apparel and accessories. And it was Michelle's overall opinion of the functionality and design direction of Maria's baby bag that our team was looking for when they presented her with some renderings and rough prototypes. My first opinion is, I trust that product. But making this a real trendy product um, may shorten its life cycle. If I were gonna prioritize the value in this, the bassinet is first and foremost. The fact that a diaper bag is attached to it and I can carry some things if I leave it in its holistic form and shape, um, that does add some value to me. After testing the product for the first time, Michelle saw value in its functionality. I do think it has legs, and I do think it's a really novel idea that, that truly will maybe become one of the staples in a baby registry if all goes well. But had some advice for the design team as they move forward with Maria's three-in-one baby bag. It's a neat opportunity because this product is so new and fresh and exciting in the world of baby products in what it can in terms of what it can do and what it can offer but why not make it something that becomes somewhat of a conversation piece that people are proud to carry both men and women that they feel um, like they truly have the new neat product on the market Another product in desperate need of a makeover is Russ and Brent's Wing Volcano. Now their paper mache prototype got the point across. Wings are served here, the bones go in here. It's a great prototype, but nowhere close to being ready to go to market. Brent and I have full-time jobs. We're not really in a position to you know, 
spend from 7 o'clock to 1 o'clock in the morning working on uh, you know, an idea that, um, that is great, but on the other hand, just requires a lot of resources to kick it off. We liked Russ and Brent's idea. It was a great concept, and they came in with their paper mache model. But that's not enough. We need a proof of concept model to actually see if the product actually delivers on the promise that they had stated. So our first step here is to actually build a proof of concept model out of the right materials, test the product, and if it works, then we'll take it to the next step, and that is to design a product that actually is appealing. Before the Everyday Edison's engineering team could build a rapid prototype of Russ and Brent's wing volcano, lead industrial designer Daniel Bazell had to do some rapid research before putting pencil to paper. With the clear design direction in mind, Daniel turned his attention to 3D modeling and prepared to present the wing volcano's new look to Russ and Brent. This classic design scenario, we've got an opportunity here. Um, a very short window of time that we had to get the project done, so the designs you're gonna see today were done within hours and a portion of that time was actually spent on site at a wing restaurant. I mean, we did all of the ideation on spot in the wing restaurant over dinner. So we actually sketched on napkins, very classic and inventor-like, and then took it back to do um, 3D modeling right away. So with a 12-inch plate, we have ways of dispersing the wings so that they wouldn't even get clogged and the, the main storage for the bones wouldn't be in that region. Um, you can see here they're, they're much more shallow than your original prototype. The product also has some other key features. We have 15 wells built in the outer tray area, but we've also built that um, upper cone or the cavity for inserting the bones um, so that it actually can hold a dip container. Um, so when a waitress is coming out with the bones and she's coming out with two 15 wing servings with the dip in the top of that opening to originally, and then she can of course remove them and, and put them on the table surface. So that was another kind of element that we will even add to your IP, the fact that it fits these disposable um, dipping sauce containers. Well, I, I loved it. You know, I thought it took something that was very functional and added some form to it. And I think it's a fantastic design. Yeah, yeah I don't see how it could, be done. it could have been done any better. But a great looking and functioning product needs a great brand identity. So we wanted something that was catchy and we wanted the brand identity to be sports oriented. And we also wanted something that was expandable. After deciding on a name and developing a logo, the branding team presented them to Russ and Brent. We arrived at Snack Daddy, which we love. And the reason we love it is, A, it, you think of Mac Daddy, and Mac Daddy means it's the best. And kind of the minute we all heard Snack Daddy, we were like, that's it. And the reason it, it was that aha moment is because A, it's the Mac Daddy of wing servers, and it's catchy. I kind of like the concept of having something that we can put an umbrella on top of. I'd say if I had a concern, it's I think when you're building awareness for a product and a concept, I like the fact that a Wing Volcano, for example, is communicative of what you use it for. And it's restrictive in a sense, but I still think, boy, we could move a lot of um, snack daddies just if we just put wings on them. So, I, but I think, I, that said, I think we can be very successful with the name Snack Daddy and open up a lot of opportunities down the road. Like the logo, um, I guess my initial reaction, if there were anything to the negative, is that it, it, I, I don't know anyone that thinks of a chicken wing or a blue crab or a shrimp as a snack. So I'm not sure that having the right name for this product is really mission critical for its success. But that said, I, I do think we're missing an opportunity to have a name that very quickly and very easily communicates what the value proposition for our product is. Because Snack Daddy may be a, a clever, in fact it is, it's a clever and it's a nice sounding name, but it doesn't tell you anything about what you use it for. That was, that was my biggest issue with it is wing, the, the items we would use, the food items we use with this product are not snacks. After reconsidering, Russ and Brent warmed to Snack Daddy. And I think the bottom line is, we can be very successful with the Snack Daddy name. And I, I definitely um, you know, think the idea of being able to expand the Snack Daddy brand into other areas is something that we really didn't consider. That made a lot of sense.
So we've seen how important great design and a strong brand identity are to our everyday Edison's products, and how field testing prototypes can lead to some innovative changes by our engineering team right out of the gate. Next time on Everyday Edison's, the wing tray prototype is unveiled to Russ and Brent. The scrapbook ladies in Murtaugh's learn what their products will forever be known as, and Bufudium knocks Wendy's socks off. And on this and every episode, we conclude with a helpful invention lesson on Everyday Edison's. And in the United States, it's really the only country in the world that it matters that you're first, first inventor. Uh, because it really is the first inventor to file throughout the rest of the world. So the magical moment is you must be an inventor, but then you file. But in the United States, if we have two inventors, uh, and they both claim to ha have the invention, then we have to determine when did they invent. And there you go back to, if it's a biotechnology, you go back to lab notes. If it's a, an inventor of a garbage can uh, uh, a top, then you, you go back and find out, well, what notes do you have? When, what can you do to prove that you conceived of the idea by such and such a date?